Good morning. There we go. Now that's working. Good morning and welcome to Faith Cafe here at Christ Presbyterian Church. As you may be aware, we are doing a series called The Timeless God of the Old and New. So getting to know who God is in the Old Testament scriptures, particularly this fall, and uh, thinking about it as a story with themes and uh, things to focus on and to think about as it relates to both what we know from the Old Testament and how it shows up in the New Testament and how God also shows up in our lives today. So we have a teaching team, and this morning we have Rich Henderson, who will be sharing with us. And you may note on the handouts that are by the door, so feel free to grab those if you haven't yet, um, that Rich's topic is Genesis 12 through 50, and he's really going to focus on Genesis 12 one through three today, so there will be a lot of additional reading afterward that you can get to, but our hope is that you can engage today, this morning, in the theme which talks about, and then also spend some time following the instructions on the handout for how to go a little bit deeper this week. So we're very happy that you're here. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Andrea Lawson, I'm the chair of the Adult Christian Formation Committee, and we have been working on uh, cultivating discipleship opportunities and Christian formation spaces for adults in our community here. And this fall, as I said, we have a teaching team that's really helping to take Faith Cafe to another level as we explore scripture together. So if you would like to engage more with one another or with um, uh, yourself about this, you can uh, sign up for the email list. There's a sign up over here on the, the um, entry table, and you'll be given an email with some links to things and also potentially links to other people so that you can coordinate smaller groups on your own as well. So with that, I will hand it over to Rich, and thank you for being here. Thanks, Andrea. So, how many of you have been in here one of the last couple weeks? When we do an Old Testament survey, I sort of feel like the first two weeks have been being on a horse at a gallop pace, right? So this week, I thought we'd try to slow it down to a canter or a trot at most. And we would hit a key component of this section. And as Andrea said, I'm going to trust that if this captivates us, um, that the resource sheet that you all have, um, the weekly next step sheet, has a lot of really good resources, some reading, some videos. Uh, that you can use to follow up with this. And I found renewing my familiarity with this section of scripture really, really interesting. Now, I'm a book reader and a play goer. Are others of you like sort of book club people or you go to APT or forward theater kind of thing? I'm choosing to see our Old Testament experience and this story, this narrative, as if we were in a book discussion or if we had gone to see a play and we were talking about a section of it afterwards. So this is a narrative, this Old Testament. It's got different types of literature that form this scripture, but it's really a book worthy of being a book discussion group. And in it, Oh, this is where we are this week. <laughs> there is story and story throughout the Old Testament. There's God's story, the capital S story, the big picture thing that God is doing. And then there are the small s stories that are us. There are stories and they're how we get involved and invested in what God is doing. And in Genesis and throughout the rest of Scripture, these two stories are inextricably interwoven. And th throughout my study this last couple of weeks, I've been thinking, if I were God, how would I have done it? And I've repeatedly come to the answer, not like this. <laughs> but God is God and he's doing things the way he does things. And so... We have this amazing story, and I'm seeing it sort of in four acts, as if it were a play. And in the first act, we have creation. And it is good, and God says it is very good. And it is full of right relationships. God has created this humanity to be in relationship with himself, in right relationship with one another in right relationship with creation, and that is good. 
God with ourselves as well. Right relationships with God, self, one another, and creation. But it's really interesting in this story, something very climactic happens very early. In the first couple pages, this rightness is broken. I mean, you're not reading, but five minutes into this book and it all falls apart. And there's immense brokenness. There's irreparable, from our side, brokenness at every level. Our relationship is broken with God, with one another, with self, with creation. And so early on, we have this big dilemma. Now, here we are in this timeline that Scott has so aptly put together for us. And we are in this block. So we're, we've gotten through Acts 1 and 2 of the play, and we're still here. Today, we embark on Act 3 that starts with Abraham. And this is a pivotal development in the story of God. Genesis 12, 1 through 3 is a hinge, it's a link that takes us from Genesis 1 to 11 through the rest of the Old Testament, the rest of the New Testament, and it actually takes us on until sometime down the road we're going to get to an Act 4, which is the consummation of human history. So if our timeline were in here, here is Act 1, here's Act 2, Act 3 goes that way really far. Not only through Genesis 12 to 50, Old Testament, New Testament, early church, us as Christ followers. And somewhere, I don't know if it's going to be in the sanctuary or in Castlescape or downtown Madison, this timeline is going to continue and there will be an Act 4 when it's all woven together. I'm looking forward to that. So today we find ourselves in Genesis 12 where there's a covenant, there's an agreement, and God is making an agreement between himself and the rest of humanity. And this kind of covenant was not uncommon in this time and this culture. And it's a kind of agreement, there were many different kinds of agreements that people would make. And in this kind, there's two parties, and in this era, what you would have done to make this kind of covenant or agreement is you would have taken large animals, cut them in half, separate them, and walk through them, each party together. And what you're in effect saying is, if I don't fulfill this covenant, so be it to me. And here God is standing alongside Abram and saying, let's make an agreement. Let's make an agreement. So we end up in Genesis 12, 1 to 3. So what I would like us to do is to just turn in groups of two or three or four people read this and what I'm asking you to read this particularly in mind and I'll come back to this is for these three things what promises do you see God make what commitments are there for Abram and what is the purpose of this agreement so promises commitments purpose so if you all would just take a few minutes I'll give you about five minutes small groups gather up Promises, commitments, purpose. No, just talking amongst yourselves. Okay, let's pull back together.
Okay, I'll say, and you may have noticed on one of the handouts that I provided, that God reiterates this covenant with Abram and his family um, throughout the subsequent section of, of the book of Genesis. So it comes up again in chapter 15 and chapter 17. It's expanded on in 21. Each of the subsequent generations gets some reiteration of this. So it's not singularly in these three verses, and you'll see it expanded upon in some of the others. So some of your answers, for those of you who read through the handout, will see that there's uh, a, a little more that there is to see here. But let's talk together about, uh, let's start with promises. What, what are the promises God makes to Abram? Great nation. Great nation. Blessing. Blessing. Protection. Where do you see that? Well, when he says, I will curse those or curse you, that implies protection, doesn't it? Okay. Make your name great. Name great. Like the whole all families in the earth. Mm -hmm. What commitments are there for Abram and his family? Go. Just go. Hmm? Yeah, going is not a small word here. We'll talk. We'll unpack these all just a little bit more. Subsequently, in one of the other iterations, he says, um, "I want you to teach each generation. I want you to teach your family about this." And in one of the versions, he also says, "There should probably be a sign for this covenant: circumcision." All the male children, starting now, regardless of what age you are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so really there's three or four main promises that God gives here. At this point, really the commitments are minimal. Well, I mean significant, but not a laundry list. And then, what are the promises that come out of this? You will be a blessing. You will be a blessing. Mm -hmm. I will give you a great nation. Mm -hmm. Fruitful. Fruitfulness. And you will be a blessed, you are blessed, you receive a blessing, so that, we were going to do grammar on this, so that you will be a blessing. So that blessing is not to be held, to be maintained, to be captivated yourself. There's a purposefulness to God's blessing to Abram. You are blessed to be a blessing to others. There's an intentional, active, directive to that bless. Blessed to be a blessing. And what else do we learn about that blessing? Among all the peoples, among all the nations. So, let's, let's go back and think about these things just a little bit more. God promises to make him a great nation. Well, what do we know about Abram at this point? Whose name means exalted father. Kids. He has no children. He's also 75 years old at this point. He's old. <laughs> Eventually God changes his name to Abraham, father of many. I was thinking, what would it be like to walk around among the people of this clan with the name father of many in your 70s with no children? I think, they're, I think that would be hard. It's almost like, you know, you sort of feel like, well, God's laughing at me or something. Why is he putting me in this people and telling me I'm going to be a father of a great nation? In fact, he says, go outside and look at the stars, as many of the stars as you see, that's the size of this great nation that I'm going to bring from you. And he's like, I have no children, and I'm old. What about going to this land? 
They're leaving Ur, they go to Haran, and then he says, here's Canaan. Is there going to be a problem with that? There's other people living in it. It's occupied. (laughs) (laughs) Now, he doesn't say from the get-go that you can't coexist with these people, although we'll have an interesting session in a few weeks about what does it mean Uh, when we see this violence that comes up in the Old Testament, that the question that bugs many of us. And what would it mean to leave? What would that mean? Leave the familiar behind. Hmm? Leave the familiar Mm -hmm. behind in your family. An extended family. I think it takes trust. I think for Abram to say, okay, God, here you are speaking to me, and you're telling me I'm going to be be blessed, be a father of a nation, I have this purposefulness, and I need to go. That says something for him to take that faith and have trust and obedience and really move out with that, and he does. And throughout the rest of this book, if you read through chapters 12 through 50 the rest of the week or subsequent weeks, look for the part it took for trust along the way. And look for how they sort of were faithful to that and how they were not so faithful to that. So here we are at the beginning of of Act 3 in this grand narrative. So we have a great creation of brokenness and then God says I am going to open the door to redemptive history I am going to restore renew make things right bring salvation to the ends of the earth through this person family clan nation what an amazing thing God is doing And he's choosing a person to become a people, and not because he's better than anyone else, not because he's rejecting everyone else, it's not because Abraham's so wonderful, God just chooses a person to become a nation, to be his instrument of salvation. And this is the beginning, though we've had hints at it in chapters 1 to 11, that God will be a saving God. Here, the doors are flung wide open. And he said, through Abraham and this family, I am going to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. I'm going to make relationships right again. But he gives them this status not as a privilege. Not as something to hang on to. Not as a we're the people of God nationalism approach. But this is a responsibility that he gives. So an amazing journey commences. And we get this lineup. Now, I always have to remind myself, even though I've been in church my whole life, and I'm like, okay, who was Isaac again? Which son was he? So we have this great lineage of what we often call in this section the patriarchs. I would like to pay attention that there are some important matriarchs in here along the way. So we have Isaac, who um, is Abraham's son by Sarah. He, uh, Abraham and Sarah have Isaac and Ishmael. They become two distinct groupings. They're separated from one another. Isaac has Jacob, who becomes Israel. And um, they, there's also Esau. There's this little spat between Jacob and Esau along the way. And they have children. Um, Jacob has children by four different women. And we come up with Joseph and his 11 brothers. And that is the, 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 actually the outline and the flow and the, and the direction of chapters 12 through 50. As, as I was reading through this again and again, I thought, this, is, this reads like a wild novel. This sings 
like a country western song. <laughs> I mean, it's like, I'm going to give my wife away, I'm going to steal your inheritance, call you to sacrifice your son, sell your brother into slavery. I mean, the themes that come up in here are really, really crazy. So, in order to sort of get an overview of the rest of the, the book without diving into all the details, I'm going to play a four minute video. There's also an eight minute version of this video that's a link on your sheet that is really, really excellent, that puts together the details of um, chapters 12 through 20. But we're going to listen to this one. We're walking through the book of Genesis, which is made up of these two main parts. And the first part begins in the garden, where we watch humanity spiral downward in self-destruction, and it ends in the Tower of Babel, where a rebellious humanity is scattered by God. Then the second part, Genesis, zooms in and focuses on just one family. And right in the middle is this story that links the two parts of Genesis together and helps us understand what the whole book is all about. So how do we get from the Tower of Babel to the story here in the middle? Well, after the scattering of Babel, there's this genealogy that follows one of the tribes all the way down to this one guy named Abram. You probably know him as Abraham. And God starts making all these promises to Abraham, like he's going to bless him and give him a ton of kids. And he says that through him and his family, all the nations of the earth are now going to find God's blessing. So basically, God is trying to restore humanity back to the goodness of the garden and to his original intentions for the world. So it's like his rescue plan for humanity. And that's why the whole second half of Genesis is about this one family thing. And so you have, you have Abraham, and then he has a son, Isaac, who has Jacob, and then Jacob has 12 sons. And to each generation, God renews his promise to bless them and all nations through them. So because of this promise to use this family to rescue the world, it's pretty easy to read these stories as examples of how to be a good person. But actually, for the most part, this family is totally dysfunctional. So for example, let's go back to Abraham. This whole story is about God giving him and his wife Sarah a family. But two different times, he basically gives Sarah away to other men by denying that she's even his wife. And then Sarah gets impatient about having a son, and so she makes Abraham sleep with her servant girl, which then causes all of these other problems in the family. So they get really old, and you begin to think that there's no way they're going to have a kid with her. But then, miraculously, they do. It's Isaac. And Isaac, he has two sons, Esau and Jacob. And it seems like things are going pretty good. But Jacob, the younger brother, wants the family's inheritance, which belongs to Esau, the older brother. So he devises a plan where he's going to steal it from his father, Isaac, who at this point in the story is now old and blind. Which who does a horrible stealing from your blind father? Yeah, and then he just takes off. So Jacob goes on from there to have 12 sons, big family. But Jacob loves his 11th son, Joseph, way more than all the others. And so he gives him this special Technicolor dream <laughs> Joseph. <laughs> come hate him. So much so that they plan on killing him. But they don't. They instead just sell him as a slave down in Egypt. Now, while in Egypt, through this crazy series of events, Joseph goes from being in a prison cell to becoming the second in command there. And so later on, the, the whole Middle East falls into this food shortage. And Joseph's brothers, they come down to Egypt looking for food. And then when they get there, who should they find as the ruler of the whole land? It's Joseph, that guy they sold into slavery. But he actually saves them from starving to death. And so here you have it. These are the great-grandchildren of Abraham who have done this heinous act to their brother. But God has transformed their evil into something good. And that's exactly what Joseph says here in the last paragraph of the entire book. He says, you guys planned all of this for evil, but God planned it for good, to save people's lives. Now these words, they conclude the book because they actually summarize the message of the whole story so far. Humans keep choosing evil, and we are thinking they're, they're screwing up God's plan, but he keeps turning their evil back into good. And somehow, he's going to use this family to restore humanity back to the garden. So that's the book of Genesis. But we still don't know 
how exactly he's going to use his family to bring us back to the garden. Well, yeah, but this is just the first book, so that's what the rest of the Bible sets out to answer. Aren't those great? I really, really like Tim's work on these, and there's another link to a couple other ones on that handout that um, summarizes this in even more detail. But here we are, I think the key thing is we are right smack in the middle between these two halves, this key verses of chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, where God's swinging open the door to salvation history. Do any of you recognize this? I think most everybody in this room would. Maybe Andrea doesn't. Oh, I love it. I won the third grade handwriting competition on one of those. <laughs> she won the third grade handwriting competition. <laughs> so, do you ever remember when the teacher would put one transparency on the overhead projector, and then a second one that would come over it that would sort of amplify it or build on it, and then a third one, and then a fourth one, and flip them all over like this? Well, in my sense, this is how God's been working through history. He has Abraham and the people that come from Abraham. And Abraham believed and Abraham left. Now, we saw in the video that there were some hiccups along the way. So the first transparency goes down and God says, I want to do my salvation work through you, Abraham, and your clan. Then we have Israel, the people of Israel, throughout the book of the Old Testament. And by and large, I'm not calling them a faithless or an unfaithful people, but by and large, they defaulted on this role of being God's agents of salvation history. They became self-absorbed and self-protecting. They didn't look out for the alien, the widow, those on the margins. They never celebrated the year of Jubilee that would have restored justice among the people. And they didn't really live out what is blessed to be a blessing among the nations as agents of God's salvation. So then you get Jesus, who's the next transparency that lays on top of, it, of this call for salvation, and he embodies God's call. This was predicted through the Old Testament. The people of Israel should have known. They sang the Psalms over and over and over that spoke of God's heart for the nations, predicted how God would work, and here's Jesus who takes it, embodies it, lives for it, dies for it, opens up the way of salvation, not for those who would believe in the future, but those who could look back and believe and thank God, we can look back and see Christ as that transparency who embodied salvation. Then he gives this call to the New Testament church, and boy, they struggled with that. Uh, they struggled with being God's people for, to the ends of the earth. Particularly, they struggled with the inclusion of Gentiles into the, the early church. And so we read, these are like seeds in, in Act 3. Act 3 of God's redemption history. We have scene 1, 2, 3, 4. Well, what's scene 5? Us. Still struggling. So, you know, are we blessed and revel in it? Are we blessed and say, God, thank you for making us your people. We so love being your church. We really like hanging out with one another. We really like being comfortable as your people. We can go through and study the letters of Paul and say, We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing, and we want to revel in those blessings. Or do we realize that we are the spiritual descendants of Abraham, and we are descendants of a covenant, we've been given a new covenant, but that covenant is still to be blessed, to be a blessing to those outside the kingdom family of God. There's a hundred ways, a thousand ways, that we can put this into practice. One is we, like the people throughout Genesis, are called to be people of faith, trusting God, 
and acting in obedience. And that's going to be sometimes making tricky or hard or courageous steps. It may mean walking across my street and knocking on my neighbor's door and saying, would you like to come over for dinner? It may seem easy, may seem hard, but our lives of being blessed to be a blessing are going to take faith, trust, and obedience. But we are blessed to be a blessing. This, you know, I, I, I'm thinking God calls us to act justly and love mercy and walk humbly with God. If we act justly and love mercy, our lives are going to take us into a myriad of places. It might be sharing our life. It might be sharing our faith. It might be stepping out and rallying for the earth. It might be going downtown and, and standing up for those on the margins and those who are oppressed. It might be being a global spouse person and coming and hanging out with international spouses. There's a thousand ways, but the call here is not just to revel in being blessed, but to be blessed, to be a blessing, and particularly to the ends of the earth. I'm going to give an unabashed <laughs> promotion for who we are here at Christ Press. So the Christian Witness Committee has worked over the last couple of years to say, we're going to have three engagement areas as a church. We're going to get involved in justice and hospitality and community development. And we're going to look through all the ministries that we've been involved with and we're going to prioritize some of them. And so in each area, we're going to have about three areas that we're going to try to call the congregation to a communal effort with. Now, we all may have our own individual things that we're doing, but as a church, these are the things that we are doing to extend our blessing beyond ourselves and to the ends of the earth. So our, our involvement with Moses, with um, in incarceration issues, refuge and sanctuary with um, those who are on the edges in our community when it comes to immigration, the Community Immigration Law Center. We extend hospitality in a lot of ways through Luke House, Third Space events, Gather X events, Madison International Partners, and we're engaged with community development, like we saw in church this morning for those who were in service already with Mendota School, and we have partnerships in Mexico City and Egypt. These are our ways to be blessed and extend our blessing to the ends of the earth. I was talking, I'm sad Cheryl's not here this morning, Cheryl Hainer, I was going to ask her to tell a little story, um, so I'll give you a snippet of it, and you can ask her about this later, but she's been involved in missional efforts forever and on boards and um, you know international justice mission and world vision and world vision international and she said to me this week i finally found my niche in being a blessing to the ends of the earth i said what's that she goes i love hanging out with the global spouses <laughs> She said it was sort of intimidating at first, and I went there, and it sort of didn't feel like it mattered or not whether I was there. And starting up conversations with these spouses of international scholars was a little uncomfortable, and now I love it. I won't miss it. I'll schedule my schedule around it. This is my chance through conversation and friendship to influence God's kingdom to the ends of the earth. Something simple, showing up on a Thursday from 1 to 2.30. Now, I'm not saying that's what everybody should do or what the, your schedule allows, but oh, that we would all, before we were my age, find our places to step into what it means to be blessed, to be a blessing. Let me pray. Lord God, thank you for your wild and crazy and complex yet simple narrative. That you have a capital S story and for some reason you've interacted with us and brought our little S stories into this. And you choose to work in us and through us for your purposes. And may we stand in the line of Abraham and Sarah and go. Go to the places that you call us. And step into your redemptive purposes for our lives. Thank you that 
you would make that covenant, that agreement with us. How crazy. Help us to trust, to be obedient, to be faithful, to see you do your amazing work for your glory. Amen. Thank you to Rich for leading us this morning. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the Learn and Serve opportunities, there are brochures by the stairs um, on the little table there, so there's a little more description of each of the um, areas of focus that we have here. And then Clinton Audie Ford is the uh, commission chair for that organization, and so feel free to connect with him as well if you want to learn more. Um, we invite you to return next week to talk more about Exodus. And if you miss a week, that's fine, but come back for the next one so that you can pick up with the story. We will have information on the website so that you can engage with the topics and the materials even if you're not able to be here. And then we post all of the, um, the lectures or the times up on the website as well so that you can follow along there. So uh, we invite you to continue to join us as we uh, go through this story. So thank you. Have a great day. Thank you.